Hello, I am Dr. Charles Gieschen, coming to you from Concordia Theological Seminary with this podcast for um, the Gospel lesson on All Saints uh, Day. Uh, usually All Saints uh, is observed on the 1st of November, but many congregations, because they don't have a service on the 1st of November, just move it to the closest Sunday because of uh, Reformation. Usually it's, then it's the first Sunday in November. And uh, so this text uh, is firm, whether you have series A, B, or C. Uh, we, the, the gospel for all saints is uh, the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount on Matthew chapter 5, uh, found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through verse 12. Just a few words in terms of preaching on all saints and preaching this text. First of all, uh, I think it's always important when you're preaching on all saints to be sensitive to the fact that um, every church member will be thinking about a loved one in Christ or loved ones, plural, in Christ who are already with Christ, namely they have uh, died. And so in our sermon, in our preaching, I think it's very important to connect with that, um, whether we're talking a lot about ourselves as saints now, uh, it still is important to speak about the state of the saints um, who have already uh, died, who are with Christ, and who will be raised on the last day, whom we will be united with. Secondly, I think it's also important, it's a great Sunday, to emphasize the church universal. Namely, that uh, beyond our confines as a congregation or our beloved synod, the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, uh, this is a Sunday where we recognize the wider church universal, both in heaven and on earth, and of the church on earth, all true believers who believe and trust in Christ um, uh, for salvation. So it's a great time to emphasize what we, um, what we confess in the creeds about the one holy apostolic church. It's also a time in which we uh, recognize, as I alluded to before, that all Christians are saints, not just a few, you know, St. Mary, St. Paul, St. Uh, Matthew, uh, St. Peter, but all Christians are saints, and here's where uh, we have an opportunity in preaching the Beatitudes, is to emphasize not only the fact that uh, we fall short uh, of, um, which we always recognize all of us are sinners, but who we are in Christ Jesus. We are at the same time sinner and saint. Why? Because of who Jesus is as the perfect one before God who gives us his perfect righteousness. So it's a great time to emphasize the, uh, the present state uh, of Christians as saints and certainly because of Jesus' righteousness which assures them of their future state in terms of the heavenly reward. And I think you'll see this in uh, the text where you have sometimes the present tense used as well as the future, emphasizing our present condition or state in Christ as well as what awaits us, what we will inherit uh, as saints when we um, leave this life and especially when Christ returns in glory, raises us, and restores his creation. Uh, one other uh, general observation for this text is I think it's important to beware of preaching it as an ethical admonition. It's, uh, many commentaries tend to view the Beatitudes almost as ethical admonitions. Thus they see them in terms of Lutheran preaching, they see them as all law, not gospel. I would emphasize I uh, encourage you to emphasize that these uh, Beatitudes are primarily gospel, namely they're reflecting a state of being that uh, is already true for us who are in Christ. Because these are true, one might say, of Jesus, um, then they are true of those of us who have been baptized into Jesus, have been united with Jesus through faith. And so this is really also describing not only what you know, we will have at the end, but also what we presently have as saints in Jesus Christ. So let's get into the text now, and here we'll go to our, 
our board with the Greek text is laid out. You have in the, the beginning, these first two verses, uh, you have the setting of the wider Sermon on the Mount. And remember, the Ma Gospel of Matthew is uh, structured with five major discourses. In a sense, it's like a Christian Pentateuch where you have five major sections of Jesus' teaching. This happens to be the very first of those five major discourses, the, the Sermon on the Mount. The, where, the reason it gets its name, the Sermon on the Mount, is obviously because of the emphasis of Jesus going to an uh, orus, a, a going onto a mountain. So you have uh, the subject here, uh, in the verb, namely, it's speaking about Jesus. And anabino, uh, here you have the aorist form. Jesus is ascending uh, onto the mountain after, here's your, um, your participle that's functioning in relationship to the verb. Uh, so this verbal activity is, is happening prior to this verbal activity of the main verb. So after um, Jesus saw the, had seen the crowds, uh, then he ascends to the mountain. And one might say it's partly because of his having seen uh, the, the, the crowds, the various needs, now he teaches his disciples about the church, about life in the church, in this first major discourse, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and then it has what happens after he uh, ascends to the to uh, or, or goes up on the mountain and a very important part of the background for this imagery which we would be familiar with is the fact that Moses gave was given the law after going on Mount Sinai so there is some Moses Jesus typology in the sense that you have now Jesus going up to the mountain and actually being the one who gives revelation um, he is uh, one who is greater than Moses in the sense he's the very source of revelation. Just as Yahweh spoke in, the, in old to Moses, now we have Jesus, who is Yahweh in the flesh, um, speaking and revealing from this mountain, uh, just as he, and as the pre-incarnate son, revealed to um, Moses on Mount Sinai. And then you have this genitive absolute construction here, and it's a different subject than um, uh, you have with the main verb. So, um, and after they had um, uh, approached him, uh, excuse me, and after, uh, let me see here. Um, Yeah, and after he had sat down, that's what you, you have the verb, uh, the participle there, after he had sat down, and that's a position of teaching, then you have the, uh, the main verb here, his disciples approached him, come to him. So Jesus here is teaching his disciples. He takes the posture of being seated, uh, aorist participle, so that action is completed. Uh, it's a, the subject is Jesus, a uh, different subject than the main verb, which is the main verb subject is right here. Then his disciples approached him. So Jesus is teaching. When he's teaching here, uh, he's teaching to his immediate followers, not just the 12, but the various people that are following him. He is teaching. Uh, he's teaching to to basically his followers. So the, the audience is not the Pharisees or anything, it's his Christian followers, which also helps you to see how the Beatitudes fit in. And then you have him, uh, aorist participle, after uh, he opened his mouth, uh, then he teaches. This verb, very important throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus, one of the primary um, activities of Jesus in his earthly ministry, one might say it's second to the primary activity of him giving his life, giving his, um, his whole self in, as an atoning sacrifice is the fact that central to his earthly ministry after that action is the action of teaching. And it's very much linked to preaching. So he's preaching and teaching. Here the, uh, the emphasis is 
is he taught them. And what did he teach them? He starts off this first discourse uh, of the five major discourses with this term that we see, and I blocked it out just so that you can see the patterning here. Here we call these the Beatitudes because we have this term that's put in the in the in the front position for emphasis of makarioi. Makarioi uh, is speaking of uh, blessed ones. So uh, what does it mean to be a blessed one? It means not just that one is happy. Uh, it means one is in a state of being blessed by God, and being blessed by God means being saved and delivered by God. So blessed ones... Uh, is really speaking about our present and future state of being saved. Uh, and here the emphasis, and we can see that all the way through with this makarioi, and it's always put in first position for emphasis. So who are the blessed ones? The subject of um, the blessed ones in each of these so-called beatitudes, I've just highlighted in yellow. Uh, so it immediately follows, understood here is the verb to be. You just have the predicate um, uh, first, and then you have the subject in second position. You have the predicate nominative. Why? Because it's just for emphasis. Blessed, who, are, uh, who is blessed? The poor ones in spirit. Um, and this is the first of the Beatitudes, sort of... Uh, programmatic for all the rest. Who are the poor in spirit? It's not just the people who are economically poor, but they're poor in spirit in the sense of they are the ones who have, who have uh, uh, spiritual needs. And then you always have, as we can see stylistically, the haughty clauses that follow. So once you have this predicate nominative construction with, um, with um, uh, blessed ones, and who the blessed ones are, then you have the haughty uh, clause because, so why are these poor ones in spirit blessed ones? Because the kingdom or the reign of the heavens is presently there. Now, we're going to see a lot of future tense verbs. And that's true in the sense that oftentimes we speak about what will come, we don't have all of the blessings of um, our salvation yet. There, there are many things that we have now, but there's a lot of things that are coming on the last day when Christ is raised. So we see a lot of future tense verbs in several of the Beatitudes. However, in this first one, it is interesting where the emphasis is present tense, because theirs is the kingdom of the heavens, it's not just that we have the kingdom of the heavens on the last day. Uh, in, indeed, on, on the last day, we will have resurrection. We will experience the fullness of God's reign. However, already now, we have God's reign, his gracious reign. Why? Because Jesus brought that reign, the kingdom of the heavens, in his ministry, especially in his death and resurrection, he established his reign as king over this fallen creation, as conqueror of sin and death in his resurrection, and that reign now is a present possession. So we talk about let your kingdom come. We're talking in the Lord's Prayer. We're not only talking about God's future reign through the resurrection and restoration of creation, but we're talking about what we already have now by virtue of being baptized, having the forgiveness of sins, having uh, the union with Christ, sharing in his victory, these are all present tense blessings. And so when we're talking about our status as blessed ones, our status as saints, uh, the status of those who are you know, uh, presently uh, in this world, uh, we already have the, the reign of God, the gracious reign of God. It's a present blessing. You go on to the next beatitude, blessed um, are the, um, the, the, uh, the ones, the mourning ones. Here I would say um, we understand how sin brings uh, uh, hurt, harm, death, 
and with that kind of activity comes mourning. Uh, there is no one who has not felt the sting of, of, um, of death and thus uh, mourned. And so here uh, one might say Jesus is saying those who have gone through this, you know, it's, this is a descriptive of the, the Christian life, of the life of, of uh, the church, if you will, uh, that we, even though we are redeemed by Christ, we still struggle with the effects of sin, we still mourn. But then there is the, the assurance um, here. What? Because they will be comforted. You have this future passive. And I, I think that the interesting uh, thing here is not only that it's future tense, namely we will be comforted in the future. Certainly one can say that God comforts us um, in light of his word and comforts us in light of bringing us his presence and the sacraments. But also, ultimately, we are comforted. And here's where one could bring out the saints who are in heaven. We will ultimately be comforted when we are brought into Christ's presence after death, and especially when we are raised and have all of God's children joined together in resurrected glory. That will be the ultimate realization of this future comfort. Notice it's also in the passive voice. The understood here is we're going to be comforted by God. God is the actor bringing this comfort to us. Uh, we strive on our own, but we cannot bring comfort to ourselves. However, God can and does bring that, um, bring that, um, that comfort. Parakaleo is a beautiful uh, verb in the New Testament. Uh, it can mean sometimes encourage. It can mean comfort here. In light of the morning, I think that's a, a, a fair uh, translation in, in this particular beatitude. Next beatitude. Blessed are the, uh, the lowly here. And uh, here, lowly, I think, uh, uh, synonym, the humble, uh, the ones who are humble, uh, might be a way of bringing this out. Uh, why? Because they, there, you have this uh, intensifier in these beatitudes. Autoi, autoi. We see that several places throughout the uh, beatitudes. It intensifies they. They will inherit another future tense, the earth. And I think uh, one of the things that's um, maybe striking here is people would say, well, why don't we have something like they will inherit the heaven? They will inherit the heavens. They will inherit uh, heaven. Uh, here you have they will inherit the earth. I think this simply is helping us to see that a vital part of our heavenly existence is the restoration of creation. And so although um, uh, on this side of eternity, if you will, uh, we often struggle, uh, many of God's children they have basic needs met, but not necessarily in terms of having uh, all the abundance uh, of, of life. But the assurance is they will inherit the earth in the sense of creation will again bring them its abundance, much like pre-fall Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden. That, I would say, is kind of the background for this. And, you know, the... Um, Beautiful images that we have of uh, our future state in, in uh, the book of Revelation, for example, chapter 7, verses 9 uh, through 17. That, one might say, is uh, reflecting this, this image of what we will inherit, a restored creation. Revelation 21, 22 has more uh, pictures of that. Uh, and one might say, uh, in speaking about this, uh, Many, uh, many people will be thinking about what is the state of their present loved ones who have passed away. Well, they are already with Christ, but they too will inherit the earth in the sense of their bodies being raised uh, and, and experiencing the restoration of creation. That's an absolute certain promise. They are already at peace, but they will have even more when Christ returns uh, and raises them and they inherit with all of God's saints the earth. And then six, blessed are the, um, the ones who 
are hungering, you have participle, and thirsting, participle, uh, for righteousness. Here, um, one can say about so many of these beatitudes, like who is truly uh, a lowly one or humble one? We see this in the person of Jesus. Who is one that truly hungers and thirsts thirst for righteousness? To really understand what that's like in human flesh, just look at Jesus. He is the ultimate one who hungered and thirsted for righteousness. And indeed, as he was dying on the cross, what does he say? I thirst. He literally thirsted. Why? Because he was willing to go to death for us. He was seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness on our behalf. He is inherently righteous, but he was winning righteousness that it may be shared with us. And here we have this, uh, this emphasis of those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. We see that in Jesus so that we see that also now in in, in our lives, in all those who are baptized into Christ, and we're, we're active, seeking the kingdom of God, seeking um, his righteousness. Why are we blessed then, those that are doing that? Because uh, uh, the, uh, the thrust of this is uh, they are the ones then who uh, will be satisfied. Uh, and here the image of, of hungering and thirsting is contrasted with the future tense, they will be satisfied. Uh, you see in the book of Revelation this image of um, they will not hunger anymore or thirst anymore um, because the Lamb will lead them by streams of living water, provide for all of their needs. So this is the emphasis. One day, um, those who have sought the kingdom of God, sought his righteousness, struggled here on earth, will one day no longer struggle. Um, they will have all of their, their needs met. They will be completely satisfied. And that, again, I think is speaking of the full restoration of creation. In a preliminary way, we can say this happens already as we taste the Lord's Supper. Uh, he, he satisfies us. But in the ultimate way, it's speaking of the heavenly banquet, of, of being in Christ's presence and restored glory. Uh, and the saints who have already died have a, a, a sense of that, but together we will all experience it in fullness on the last day um, when we are resurrected together uh, and have everything satisfied. Then the next beatitude, uh, verse 7, you have blessed are the ones, the, the merciful, um, for they will be shown mercy. You have this language of mercy. Uh, we think of uh, the, the, the frequent um, prayer, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. So blessed are the ones who are merciful, the merciful ones. And here uh, you have this language then uh, of because they are, are showing mercy to others, um, one day they will be fully experience uh, the mercy of God in the sense of the, the, the deliverance from all that causes the need for, for having uh, mercy, namely they'll be delivered from sin. Uh, we've already been shown mercy in Christ. We understand that. But we will experience the full, ex uh, the full extent of God's mercy uh, on the final day. Uh, when uh, we are raised in glory. So, you know, the, uh, the present state of these saints were blessed, uh, and, and we have the future um, statement of how we will be blessed in the sense of being shown in the fullest extent the mercy that we already know and experience in Jesus, we'll experience in fullness because of of uh, the restoration of our bodies and also, um, also the restoration of creation. Uh, again, all of these um, descriptors are describing both, one might say, Jesus and those who are in Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate merciful one. Why? We see that in him giving his own life for us in the cross 
And because we are joined to him, we show mercy. We have been you know, uh, forgiven, we forgive others. We show mercy to them. And that's uh, very visible here. Then the next um, uh, uh, beatitude you have, blessed uh, are the pure ones in heart. You have this understanding of purity. Uh, when we look at this, again, it's, I would argue it's gospel. From our perspective, we might say, boy, I'm not pure in heart, so how can I be blessed? Well, keep in mind, uh, the pure in heart are the ones who trust in Jesus. And Jesus is the one who is ultimately the only one who is pure. He's the only one who's righteous. But through him, we have purity. We have his purity. We share in it. So this is a descriptor of the, the, the church, those who are in Christ. They are the pure ones in heart. And uh, why are they blessed? Um, because, again, the intensifier, they will see God. Now, this is uh, related to the Exodus 20, uh, 33, 20, where Moses wanted to see God, and God said, no one can see me and live. And so this is a beautiful promise, is that one day we will not only see God's visible image, as in the Son, where, whom we see in flesh and blood, Jesus, um, but we will see again the, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. Um, the Father who is unseen will be seen again. Uh, why? Because we will no longer have sin. We will be completely purified. Uh, so in the resurrection, uh, we will see God. What a, a, and this is a, a beautiful statement that's found in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 22, verse 4, where those who've always had the fullness of God hidden from them, they saw his visible image, uh, now will see his face. And that's directly echoing uh, Exodus 33, 20. Uh, then you have the, uh, so, uh, and one can say that, uh, again, it's an opportunity to say about those who have already passed, they are already with Christ, and, and one day together with us, they will again have eyes in the resurrection, and those eyes will behold not only their other loved ones in Christ, but most importantly, those eyes, even as um, you have Job speaking out, will see God in, you will see in your, you will be in the flesh and you will see God uh, before you. What a beautiful um, reality to proclaim. Then the next uh, blessed Blessed are the peacemakers, the ultimate peacemaker, the ones who are making peace, uh, is obviously Jesus, uh, what he did in his atonement. And because of what he has done, bringing peace between man and God, we seek to bring peace to others, both in, in terms of speaking of their relationship with God, but also between human beings. We forgive those um, uh, who have sinned against us because God has forgiven us. So we are, all of us, uh, this is our, our life, is seeking to further reconciliation uh, between God and, and other human beings and between human beings. Uh, and, and obviously, most clearly seen in Jesus, but it also characterizes all who are in Christ, the church. Uh, why? Because they, again, the intensifier, um, will um, be called sons of God. Uh, and one can say we are already sons of God, but there is a, a, a future tense here. And I think it's just emphasizing uh, the fact that we will have this status of, of being the inheritor uh, on the last day. We aren't going to be slaves. We're going to be sons who inherit. So they will be called. Uh, sons of God. Again, emphasizing the future blessings for those who are already blessed. In, um, and then you have the last two here that are very closely related. And the fact that this language of persecution comes up again uh, 
uh, right here in the next, um, the final beatitude, just shows how this beatitude is further explained and explicated in this final uh, beatitude. So you have here the language of blessed are the persecuted ones on account of righteousness. We saw this language of of uh, righteousness earlier. You see dikaiosune twice right here. It's an important term for, for Jesus. Uh, is uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, he also talks about seeking first the righteousness of God. Jesus is the righteousness of God. So if you're persecuted on account of righteousness, it means you're persecuted on account of Jesus. Uh, and uh, one can say, uh, why then are they blessed? Because, and here again, uh, you have a shift to the present tense. Here we saw it at the beginning. We see it again here. Because the kingdom of the heavens, we saw that earlier in this uh, uh, beatitude, the kingdom of the heavens is theirs. So most of these tenses are future. Most of them are speaking about the ultimate end time blessings. Here we're speaking about our present state of having the reign of the heavens, the reign of God, as a present blessing. Um, even though we are currently persecuted on account of, of our, of our um, belief in Jesus. And one can say that in America we can only expect this to increase, what Jesus is saying here. And in this final beatitude, Blessed are you when, and this can be understood as generalizing, whenever, um, and then you have a heaping up of some of this, when they insult you, uh, namely uh, picking up on the fact that we are persecuted. There are persecutors, so they would be the ones who are persecuting you. And so we know that Jesus, when he's speaking all these Beatitudes, is speaking to his disciples. Uh, each of them are describing the church, the, the followers of Jesus. So, uh, whenever they insult you, persecute you, and also say all kinds of evil uh, against you, um, right here. So, you have this uh, imagery of... Um, of uh, the kinds of activity, the kinds of things that lead you to be called persecuted ones. It's just spelled out more in this beatitude. And then he climaxes not by saying, be depressed about it, but he says, rejoice and exalt. You know, the imperatives there, because your, re your, <clears throat> uh, because your reward, uh, uh, your payback, if you will, um, is, uh, is great, polus, in the heavens. And so the emphasis then, I would argue, is again the future blessings. The future helps us to endure the present challenges. What our future as saints helps us to deal with the challenges that sin brings in our present uh, fallen state. Uh, and then he reminds us that uh, just as uh, we are persecuted, insulted, and, and the like, Thus, for thus it was um, that they persecuted the prophets who came before you. So, just as the prophets were persecuted, Jesus was persecuted. Just as Jesus is persecuted, so we also are persecuted. So, you see how these Beatitudes, one might say, are true, especially of Jesus. And because they're true of Jesus, they're true of those who are baptized into Jesus. Well, the Lord's blessing upon your proclamation of such an important um, text on such an important feast day.